If we're interested in trying outdoor backpacking for the first time, figuring out how to get started might be a little overwhelming and confusing. If we look at backpacking gear online, we find an ocean of the stuff. There are so many different types of packs and tents and stoves and boots. How is somebody supposed to know what's the best? And if we go backpacking in the woods, how are we supposed to go to the bathroom when there are no bathrooms? What if a cloud of mosquitoes comes after us? What if we see a bear? What if we're surrounded by snakes? What if a huge hairy spider gets in our tent? We're going to take a look at these issues and others. We'll talk about what I think is the most important factor in backpacking and why. We'll talk about things you absolutely need to be prepared for and why. We'll talk about mistakes you should not make and why. Let's start with what I think is probably the most important issue, and that's what's going on and what will go on inside our own head. Are we interested in backpacking because it sounds like an adventure? Are we interested because we think it might be a challenge? Do we enjoy being tested by unexpected problems? The more of these questions we answer yes to, the better is our frame of mind to become a backpacker. And if we don't have much confidence in ourselves, that can be improved. A very experienced guy named Colin Fletcher wrote a series of backpacking books called The Complete Walker. In this book, he offers the opinion that if an inexperienced, panicky, uninventive, and fumble-fisted backpacking novice gets caught in a three-hour thunderstorm, that hiker might get hypothermia no matter what kind of gear they have. What Fletcher is really telling us is that we were all inexperienced at one time, but... When it was necessary, we kept our cool and figured out ways to handle whatever we had to deal with. We learned how to use our gear correctly. Fletcher is telling us that our attitude and our ability to think are vital, no matter what kind of gear we have. Some people get into backpacking with baby steps. First they become campers, and then they start with short backpacking trips. This allows people to increase their ability and confidence with each outing. This kind of slow start is also good for introducing children to backpacking. A good beginning is to get them accustomed to sleeping in a tent, even if in the backyard. If parents work to make it fun, it can be fun. Once they are older and bigger, they can carry their own sleeping bag in a pack and make trips under easy conditions. Other hikers, older of course, choose to make their first backpacking trip a really big one. For example, setting out to hike the entire Appalachian Trail, about 2,190 miles, and many of them will succeed. If we encounter problems on a hike like that, at the time they might seem quite serious, but the upside is their lessons will sink into our heads very deeply. One thing that's easy to overlook is our physical condition. Carrying a pack full of stuff is physical work. Some sources tell us carrying a heavy pack up a big hill is four times as much work as carrying the same pack over level ground. If we want to backpack with any frequency, we will be helped by making physical training part of our lifestyle. It will help if we walk a lot, especially uphill. We can ride our bicycles, and it also helps if we do that uphill. Going to a gym and learning different exercises also can help. Beginning backpackers think about gear a lot, which is to be expected if we don't have any. What kind of backpacking gear is the best? Gear selection is very often a trade-off. If some piece of gear promises to be faster or more comfortable or more amazing than something else, it often will weigh a hell of a lot more than whatever the something else is. And if backpacking, we have to carry it. And, if some piece of gear promises to be far lighter than something else, odds are good it will take a little more patience and attention and thought to use correctly compared to whatever the something else is. Later, we'll take a detailed look at a backpacking gear list. It's important to concentrate on the needs we must take care of when we go backpacking. These are the most fundamental, the needs we don't want to ignore. The gear that will help us do that can vary a lot from person to person. I took my first long backpacking trip when I was 14 years old. It was 12 days and nights. Some folks today might be shocked at the gear I did not have. It was a long time ago and I had what was the best gear I could find at the time. This is my personal gear on that trip. Another kid and I took turns carrying a six-pound canvas tent that had no floor. If we look at a lot of gear lists online today, by comparison, the stuff I had seems like it was practically nothing. Yet, I got along just fine. This was a trip to the Philmont Boy Scout Ranch in New Mexico, and I was one of about 30 kids in our group. 
All of our cooking was done over a fire, which I believe is no longer the practice. We ate nothing but dehydrated food, and I took turns carrying some items. None of us had some of the outdoor items that are considered so essential today. That includes having hip belts on our packs, single burner cook stoves, water filters, and sleeping pads. Some of those things did exist at the time, but my friends and I bought our stuff at department stores that didn't carry anything quite that exotic. Here's a young guy I met on the Appalachian Trail, fairly recently of course. He didn't have a sleeping pad either, I assume because he couldn't afford one. I recall some of his gear was borrowed and donated, and it reminded me of what I carried when I was 14. This guy was having a great time on the AT. He is a reminder that it's possible to backpack with whatever we can get our hands on. During that trip I made at age 14, a number of the other boys got bitchy and stayed bitchy. We didn't get rained on that much, the hiking wasn't that hard, we had plenty to eat, so what was their problem? At the time, in the age before smartphones, I thought it was because they couldn't watch TV, they didn't have Coke or Pepsi to drink, and they didn't have candy bars to eat, and I still think that was the problem. This leads to a point that's true even today. Backpacking is rarely, if ever, as comfortable and convenient as being at home. Even if we have the most luxurious sleeping system on the planet, we still have to walk everywhere we go and carry all our stuff with us. And if it starts raining like hell, we're stuck in it. As we gain experience, we might decide we don't like some piece of gear we have and we want to replace it with something else. This is pretty normal. If we are inexperienced, we are basically making guesses about what will work well for us. Emphasis on work well for us as we go to buy our first gear. And that's pretty normal too. We really learn about our gear by taking it out and using it repeatedly. If we try to buy everything at a store, a salesperson might try to talk us into buying the most expensive stuff they have. I would, at the least, compare prices online and take some notes before going to an outdoor store. And I never hesitate to buy a piece of gear online if I read reviews about it first. If we want to learn about a particular product, we usually can find reviews of the item on Amazon.com. So, how about those snakes and spiders and bears? If we really worry about snakes or bugs getting us when we sleep, by all means, we should use a commercial tent with a floor. Colin Fletcher was not inexperienced, and he was not panicky. He would sleep in his sleeping bag in the open with no tent in temperatures as low as 9 degrees Fahrenheit. Many of his travels were in the American West, where there are mountains, deserts, snakes, scorpions, and the occasional bear. He thought tents were helpful in cold and windy conditions, but he didn't think they were really needed in the rain. To deal with the rain, he often rigged up a large piece of plastic as a tarp. He said any fear of rattlesnakes is based more on myth than fact. He said we are unlikely to see a scorpion unless we look under a lot of rocks and the idea they would enter our boots at night is an old wives' tale. He said black bears are more of a nuisance than a danger. When once confronted by a grizzly in Alaska, he pulled out a revolver, but he didn't shoot it. Instead, he used it to tap on a metal cup and the noise scared the bear away. Because he was cool-headed and experienced, he didn't lose sleep over dangers that are statistical rarities. For 16 years, I have used tents with no floors exclusively. So like every venomous snake and big spider and centipede is going to just stampede through the woods just to get inside my tent? Well, the fact is, they don't. I haven't seen any in my tent in 16 years. In fact, I haven't seen any of them anywhere near my tent in that time. Except for one rattlesnake, I haven't seen any of those guys running wild in the woods during that time in North America. Bears, however, are a different story. It's not that they are eager to kill us. Instead, they would love to steal our Pop-Tarts and granola bars. In some areas, the same could be said of raccoons. And on the Appalachian Trail, the most common furry food thief is the mouse. If we're in an area where there are bears, we need to hang our food in a tree at night. For a long time, I put my food in a garbage bag and hung it about 10 feet high in a tree with a piece of nylon rope. For areas that have few trees, we can buy a bear canister. It's basically a big can, usually made out of some polymer material, and a bear can't figure out how to open it. Backpackers often worry about mosquitoes, and I don't blame them. Mosquitoes are going to be most common near ponds and swamps. Those who will want to avoid mosquitoes will have better luck if they don't camp near ponds and swamps. In some other areas, however, mosquitoes will be everywhere. I carry bug spray and let it go at that, 
but head nets are available and bug screens are included in almost all tents. Next, the going to the toilet thing. If there are no privies or outhouses around, we're going to have to poop in the woods. I don't make the rules, but I know what they are. The rule is dig a hole, do it in the hole, and put the dirt back in the hole. Outdoor stores often sell small plastic trowels for this job. For the record, I have never gotten anything on that trowel except the dirt I moved to make the hole. There are two general kinds of mistakes a backpacker can make. The first is the kind that can get us in trouble, and sometimes that trouble can be very serious. One of the most dangerous mistakes would be to get lost. I have been lost myself in a wilderness area, and it is scary like you wouldn't believe. Later, I'll do a video about that story. Any of us, no matter how experienced, can get lost if we don't pay attention. In some areas, there's a real danger we could die while lost. So the rule is always pay attention. Virtually every place we might hike is covered at least by a geographical survey topographical map. And many areas will be covered by a trail guide. Whatever is available, I suggest we should carry. Even if on a designated trail, I carry a compass. I would suggest that anyone planning to hike in wild wilderness areas take an orienteering or navigation course. Some clubs and outdoor stores will hold those and they will also hold backpacking courses. Those also are a fine idea. None of these examples consider accidents like people who fall and break a leg. They also don't consider how really impulsive people can act and how creatively they can get themselves into trouble. It's not a good idea to see how close we can get to a bear or to dance on the edge of a cliff. In one national park, a group of hikers went unprepared into zero degree weather and decided to burn their coats to stay warm. I have come close to running out of water while backpacking, and the idea of running out scares me. I never walk past a decent water source without topping off my bottles, unless I am 1,000% sure there is decent water up ahead. When we pick a campsite, we should look to see if any large dead branches or leaning dead trees are overhead. That stuff will fall down eventually, and we don't want to be underneath when it happens. We should also look around to see if we are standing in a spot that's lower than all the terrain around us. If we are, it might flood during a long, heavy rain. If we find a place that's higher than most of the immediately adjacent ground, it's a safer bet for a tent site. The second kind of mistake a backpacker can make is to leave behind evidence we were there. We carry every scrap of our trash out with us. In many areas, campfires on the ground are not permitted. If there are designated fire rings or fireplaces, we should use those. If we build a fire in the woods, the best plan is to make that fire no bigger than needed and we need to make sure it's completely out before we move on. If we build a fire on the ground, the best thing we can do is leave behind no trace we even built a fire. We should also remember that in some areas, the risk of wildfires is very high under dry conditions, and we need to be aware of when those conditions occur. Another mistake a backpacker can make is to go into the woods with gear that cannot protect them from rain or cold and leave half of the stuff just sitting there and head for home if they get soaked in a big rain. This has happened more than a few times. Maybe those who leave this kind of stuff behind think someone else will want it. Virtually no one is going to want it. It's just a mess somebody will have to clean up. So let's not do that, please and thank you. Let's talk about gear in the context of rain for two reasons. One, I have been rained on badly everywhere I've been, even in the American West, so it helps to be ready. Even if the forecast is for clear weather, rain could still surprise us. Two, gear that's good for rain is equally good for no rain. So let's run down a gear list. First, the tent. In the description, I have put a link to a tent called the Big Agnes Fly Creek. Not because I think you should necessarily buy it, but because it's an example of a quite good backpacking tent. Open up the link and take a look. One of its main features is a rain fly that covers the entire tent. You can even put your pack and muddy boots under the fly, but outside the tent. All of this means excellent rain protection. The Fly Creek is expensive, but that's because it's very light. And if the weather is beautiful, we can leave the door open or maybe even leave the fly off completely. Shop around and you'll find similar tents with a big rain fly for a lot less money. But they usually will weigh more. If we buy a cheap tent from a place like Walmart, it will most likely have a little rain fly that won't cover the entire tent. 
and that increases the risk rain will get inside. If we absolutely have to use one of these, I would suggest we buy a silicone seam sealer and cover every seam with it. If we have our heart set on a hammock and a tarp or just a tarp, we should make sure the tarp is big enough that blowing rain can't get under it. There are many relatively inexpensive sleeping bags that work just fine in the summer. Every backpacker I have ever met slept in their clothes or even put on more clothes for sleeping. In freezing weather, we can either use a heavy bag or a lighter but more expensive down bag. Inside the pack, I always carry the sleeping bag in a plastic garbage bag. It's extra insurance to make sure the sleeping bag stays dry. If we absolutely must sleep on our side, we might need an inflatable sleeping pad. Some are really heavy and some are kind of pricey. If we can sleep on our back, we might get by with only a closed cell foam pad, such as a ridge rest. We can buy little camping pillows if we really need one. I have never ever gotten completely soaking wet while hiking because since day one I have always carried a poncho in everything except deep winter. A poncho will cover me and my pack. Look at this photo and you'll see I tied cords to the back corners of the poncho. I pulled them to the front and tied them at my waist. This helps keep the poncho from blowing around in the wind. In colder weather a rain suit is a very very good idea because it can keep us from getting chilled. A rain suit that can breathe is my first choice because we can sweat badly inside a plastic rain suit. On my last visit to Walmart, I saw a breathable rain suit for $20 and it would be a good choice. If we use a rain suit, we'll need a pack cover to keep the pack dry. For cooking, canister stoves are easy to use, fast, and not very expensive. They can work well in all but the most extreme cold when a white gas stove might be a better choice. When it rains, some people cook under a small tarp, for example 8 by 5 feet. But if we build a fire, we don't want to burn up our tarp. Some people like to cook elaborate meals, and if we're going out for one or two nights, why not? These days, any backpacker I have seen who is hiking really long distances and cooking meals used a pot for cookware and made food choices that could be cooked that way. Some of them also carried a cup, but not everyone did. Freeze-dried backpacking meals are expensive, but for many backpackers, they are part of the fun. As insurance against rain on a really long trip, a good plan is to carry some items so we don't have to cook. For example, crackers, peanut butter, and tuna. Instant mashed potatoes, by the way, can be fixed with cold water if we have to. There are many different products for carrying water. Bottles like Gatorade and Smart Water Bottles are popular choices for many. Nalgene bottles work fine, but they are heavy. I have found platypus bags to be reliable in years of repeated use. Many beginners will prefer to carry a water filter. At the moment, Sawyer's are the cheapest water filters I know of. There are many different types of water filters, and on Amazon you can expect to find reviews for all of them. The first piece of gear many people think of is the pack. If we have all of our other stuff first, this can help us know how big a pack we will need. If we have money, we can buy water resistant stuff sacks for things like clothes and food. Or we can use big Ziploc bags or plastic garbage bags. When it comes to hiking boots, there are many different kinds. On that trip I made as a 14 year old, we all had leather boots. I have not tried a lot of different hiking boots. If I was thinking of buying a particular brand, I would look again at the Amazon reviews. If we plan to walk a lot of miles, blisters on our feet can be a big threat. It's a good idea to carry band-aids and white medical tape that will let us cover any blisters we get. For moderate weather, clothes made of synthetic material are the most popular choice because they dry far more quickly than cotton. The same goes for socks. Wool is a good option for cold weather in particular if we can afford it or find it in thrift shops. The array of outdoor clothing sold for cold weather is almost endless. Other things that can round out a gear list are a headlamp or flashlight, bug spray, sunscreen, a first aid kit, a camp towel, or a bandana. If you want to learn more, my channel has more than 30 videos filled with tips about backpacking and the Appalachian Trail. And if we can successfully hike on the AT, we can do it in many other areas too. As always, a big thank you goes to my subscribers. You are very much appreciated. If you have not subscribed, it would be very much appreciated if you would. And as always, thank you very much for watching.